Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. After an incredible weekend where the Crusaders went to 0-5, and five, the Hurricanes 5-5, five and five, an incredible table, Super Rugby, all sorts of upsets, the Force beating the Reds, it, it has been an immense weekend. The Drua versus the Waratahs are incredible games. Really a wonderful weekend of rugby. So much to talk about in the show today. Got some great viewer questions and as part of the show this week, best viewer question out in New Zealand, get to build with rugby ball courtesy of player sports so thank you very much for helping the show out and giving the viewers something to get for their incredible questions we'll get to your youtube and email questions and we'll talk a little bit about tipping later on in the show as well as oh picky but first let's introduce the two guys off the back of the blues crusaders game gonna go first to james parsons the smile is rather large jibber well i mean it's rather large because i've had <laughs> a long, long time, uh, obviously in despair. So um, it was it was great to see the Blues deliver. And more importantly, it was great to see a team deliver for this skip. I thought uh, Paddy was outstanding in his first game back to go 80 minutes and, and, and the boys really uh, got behind him. And then there's Bryn Hall. Ross, I think we need to change the opening bulletin. Every time you go, the Crusaders are this, Crusaders are that. I think we should change it, the dynamic. He's actually playing really well against the Crusaders. But yes... It was, it, was, it was a tough watch. I think this one was probably the toughest to watch and we'll go in a little bit more, but yeah, um, credit to the Blues and obviously their performance. They probably should have actually won a lot more with the amount of points that uh, they left out there in that second half, but yeah, thoroughly deserved and um, unfortunately the Crusaders continue beyond that big fat zero. Okay, let's start positive then for you, Bryn. Jibba, what did you like the most about the way the Blues managed to keep the Crusaders winless? I think when Dalton got yellow carded, I think that period was very, very important. Um, and defending and holding them out. So often, I think uh, when the Crusaders have, have done really well against us and when I was playing, is they'd take those threes early, they'd really build that scoreboard pressure and then um, look to sort of wear you down. Whereas when they went to the corner, um, you know, you sort of felt when Dalton got yellow carded, it's like, man, if they get a try here, it almost could ignite them. Um, and, and the fact they didn't, I think that was massive. And I just think their defence, um, Although they had the majority of the ball, I think I think the defence is becoming a strength, and we know that that's crucial uh, leading into the pointy end of the season. Yeah, that's it. I think you know it's a bit of a baptism of fire, unfortunately, for a lot of those young men that are playing. You know, George Bell, twenty-one; Taylor Cahill, twenty-one; Jamie Hannah who had a really good performance, twenty-one, and. You know, as Jip knows, when it comes to um, the forward pack and especially in line out, having that seniority and experience is really important in big games and understanding situationally what's required. So um, it just doesn't come back to one individual person. It's a collective group. And um, obviously with them being really young, they're getting, a, unfortunately, a pretty good introduction to Super Rugby and what, it's take, what it takes to, I guess, um, win these games. But I think one thing that I guess was a little bit um, concerning for the Crusaders was their, was their defence. I don't think I've seen them miss... miss that many tackles in a, in a period of game um, for a long, long time. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate. I know the Blues have a lot of X Factor and they uh, in themselves attacked very well for long periods of that game. But, you know, that's one thing that I think Crusaders um, fans and I guess the boys will be pretty gutted about with the amount of missed tackles and I guess the defenders beat. And you look at all the stats, you know, 44 to 8, you know, that's a pretty telling stat in terms of what. Um, attacking abilities of how much pressure they put the Blues on and I guess it just shows where I guess the attack of where the Crusaders are having eight defenders beaten within an 80-minute performance is pretty concerning as well. So it just seems that there's a lot of areas that they aren't getting right in um, against the Blues, unfortunately. There were a lot of areas that they didn't get right in. Um, like I said before, and Jip, you could probably agree with this, the scoreboard probably could have been a lot, a lot worse if the Blues were able to score a few more tries in the back end of that second half. Yeah, and saying that, though, like, when you look at it, yeah, they tackled at 83%, they had um, 221 tackles. But it could have been worse. Like, there was 59 breakdowns in the 22 for the Blues. Um, multiple visits, I think it was around 11 visits for two tries. Like, you know, like, you could look at their defence statistically and go, oh, geez, it's quite bad. But actually, on the whole, it was pretty impressive the way they held on and, and had Levi or Moore got that try, you know, like that's a momentum swing. And, and um, I suppose things that we've seen in particular, which you want to do, like he has these try saving tackles that keep you guys galvanised and in the game and, and Caleb Clark came up with one of those and I think that was a big turning point. The Crusaders spent a lot of time in the Blues 22 in the first 15 minutes, Brennan. We spent a lot of time recently talking about turning, like Jip says, those entries into points. 
why do you think they struggled so much when they were kicking to the corner, going for those um, those drives and, and just couldn't execute? Like there were six lineouts um, in the first half and they lost five, you know. So when you be able to try and accumulate um, that moment, that pressure, and you're given that valve off, you know, when you get into that 22 meters, and which isn't the first time that we're talking about this with the Crusaders, unfortunately, they aren't able to sustain that pressure for long periods of time, especially with set piece. You know, you're accustomed to knowing when they get into that 22, especially in lineout malls, if there's specials as well around the transition or front peels or just you know grafting, getting in, getting into your work and being able to score with multi phases. They're not able to do that at this moment. So I think you're right, Ross. You know, with Dalton Papali'i, you know, getting that sin bin and then dominating that first 10 minutes with position and territory, not being able to score points, I think, you know, somewhat galvanised, I think, the Blues and being able to, I guess, not get that scoreboard pressure. Um, and then I think the big play, I think, in the first half was, you know, the not straight by George Bell and then with the Willie Hines yellow card, which in turn ends up being 14 points with him off the field, you know, so, and then Severis going off straight away. So that first half and then not being able to score those points, it could have been different if they were able to, score in those moments but um, like I said from that flow on effect of the sin bins and then the two tries after that um, yeah, the Blues just kind of went over the top and um, yeah like I said it's a baptism of fire for all those young guys at the moment Chip let's dig into your experience there's a failing line out you've got to fix it as a team how do you go about that as a hooker and jumpers coming together and figuring out a way forward especially when the five man continued to fail the one thing the Crusaders always do is, uh, and previously they've, they've planned for the what-ifs, and maybe that just wasn't there. I, I do think they went to it late in the game. You watched, they did the overthrow. They didn't really use the line-out. They overthrew um, to the midfield coming on to it. Um, but the irony is there was a final uh, not so long ago at Eden Park yeah. where the Crusaders put on a clinic at line-out and you saw the same sort of struggles um, for, a, uh, for a young Blues team. You know, experience does matter. I, I do think that, like, you look at Jamie Hanna, like, that was an amazing game he had, like, 30 tackles, 10 carries, you know, a magnitude of rucks. Um, but, you know, you build experience through knowledge and, you know, through failures, you'll be better for it. And I do think this young Crusaders pack will be much better for it um, out the back end. I know I won't feel it now. Um, I've been there with our app. It's, it's definitely not easy and you overthink and you maybe um, you know, catastrophize and think, think it's um, you know, unsolvable. But you know, without the yellow card, she was pretty tight. There was a, there was a 10 to 12 minute period there. Um, it was the same as the Hurricanes, you know, when it's just not going your way, um, it's not going your way. And um, yeah, look, I'm not trying to make excuses for them, but it, it, having been there myself, I know the amount of effort. You just gotta look at Dave Havili's face. But as an interview after the game, you can see the intensity and, and almost the harder you try, the worse it gets in these situations, which sounds cliche, but it is a real. Bryn, they've obviously got guys to come back. They've got a game this week, then the bye, and then after that, we're expecting to see Barrett, Blackadder, Williams, Taylor, Burke all come back. Looking at that and, you know, being a guy who has his cup half full, do you see the Crusaders being able to make their way through the draw they've got to get into the top eight from here? I'm not too sure what's going to happen with the Chiefs this week, but after the bye, you know, they haven't left themselves a lot of wiggle room. They're going to have to get the results pretty quickly. And um, I guess the pleasing fact is a lot of those big names are coming back. And especially in the forward pack, like I talked around the numbers around how young that forward pack is. Anytime you can get the experience of a black hatter, you know, Quinton Strange coming back, Scooter, Scott Barrett, I know he's not coming after the bye, but, you know, those kind of caliber players slowly coming back in. They really just need to start try and pick up wins after the bye. And I think Fergus Burke is a big part of that as well with him being able to have a bit more experience in that playmaker role, which um, which they're lacking a little bit at the moment. And that's not to say Riley Horhepper isn't doing well. Played very well on the weekend. I think defensively did a lot of great efforts in terms of what um, Jip was talking around when Richie would make big plays defensively. He did a lot of that on the weekend. I thought he's played really well um, for a second start. But um, when you get a guy like Fergus Burke back, understanding what's required, um, it's only going to help that Crusaders team, hopefully, to kick on and, and grab those quarterfinal spots. Brent, looking into that crystal ball of yours nine or ten weeks away, if, if let's say the table was similar and the Hurricanes were top of the table and the Crusaders were going to Sky Stadium, <laughs> do you think which team do you think is going to be most nervous about that particular matchup? The Crusaders won't have anything to lose. I think well, where they are, they're not considered um, the favourites right now. You know, they're not going to finish in the top four. They're going to finish you know, in the eighth position, and if anything, they can just go 
out and swing um, as hard as they want, knowing that, knowing that's a free hit. All the pressure will be on the Hurricanes if they finish first or whoever it may be. Um, and I can tell you right now, if you're if you're sitting first, would you want to play a Crusaders team coming in eighth with all that cavalry coming back? Um, just me personally, I probably wouldn't. I could probably ask you that. You know, would you want to play a Crusaders team with all that cavalry coming back, or would you rather play another team um, in that eighth position? I think that finals experience is massive, but from what I saw of the opportunities given to those Hurricanes players on Friday night, man, they're getting a lot of competition at training. Like, they hit the ground running. They haven't played a lot of rugby, those players that have been out there Friday night. And, um, and Brendan, you can talk to this, man. You, your guys' squad depth was just immaculate when you went on the title run. Um, I, I just, I think the Hurricanes are, man, they are, they are very well placed. Um, and you look at the enthusiasm to want to start and be in that 23, man, she's, they're going to be a tough side to beat, the Hurricanes. 54-28 win over Bryn's Rebels. Um, probably for me, the standout in that, Bryn, was Harry Godfrey. Like, this kid yeah. has it all. I mean, they've got depth there at fullback. They've got a lot of it, but this kid looks the business. Well, he does. He's pretty similar to, to Ruben Love, I think. You know, similar similar stature, and I guess the skill set that I'm um, probably accustomed to seeing with young guys coming through with Ruben and obviously Godfrey, who on the weekend has all that skill set, I think, of a Ruben Love. Great distribution game, has a bit of speed, um, and obviously um, has, has had a great start to his, his internet, not his international, sorry, his domestic career with the Wellington and um, the Hurricanes. So, yeah, I think the depth that that squad's building um, we talk around winning championships and being able to win depth you know when you've got a guy like Ruben Love who we thought was probably the form fullback and you've got a guy like Harry Godfrey who's you know second and, and behind playing with performances like that haven't even touched on TJ Pedernada and how he played with his first first game coming back after a massive injury so yeah the competitiveness within that group um, you'd hate to be a coach uh, but at the same time you'd love to be a coach knowing that there's a lot of players putting their hand up and knowing that depth come at the back end of the year You've got to have your whole your whole squad firing, and the Hurricanes are certainly doing that after their performance in Palmerston North on the weekend. What impresses me most is the Hurricane system. Like he has been in the, I suppose, the pipeline for a long time, and they haven't rushed him. He's had touch points when needed through COVID. Um, but what I like is his biggest development was his ability to sort of demand the ball, you know, lead people around, um, have that courage in the air, and we saw all that and then some. Um, and, and I suppose the other thing is catching up with him afterwards. He's very modest. Like he, he was, I think the whole Hurricane squad, like every interaction I've had with them after games, they are, they feel their ceiling is um, a lot lot higher than where they're at at the moment. Um, and that just breeds that sort of competitive edge during the week. But Harry definitely made a statement. Um, and I think it just shows the importance of not rushing that young talent in to Super Rugby because it is pretty ruthless. Um, and he's had the ability to learn at training, and then that's given him the best opportunity to execute when he's been given that opportunity. Play development's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because then on the other side of it, you look at Cole Forbes coming on for the Blues, 25 years old, went overseas at 21 for a couple of years to Scotland, made his way back, and after a couple of years in NPC is now come on to the Blues and looked a million dollars in that game. It is a bizarre thing. It's, it's not an art form, is it, um, development? It happens yeah. at different times. It's not. And uh, as human beings, we are unique, um, each individual. But I think the one thing about Cole is regular game time and the opportunities he's had at Bay of Plenty. Like, he was really impressive. First game I saw him was against Auckland, um, when they probably should have won. Auckland came back to Aunt Sullivan kick the penalty late um, to win it. But it was his tactical kicking. And I think he's got a great balance and um, sense for the game of when to inject his skill set on attack, but also his, his ability to kick and find space. And look, I'm not a kicker, but I always used to hear Mick Byrne go, if a kick can bounce twice, you've, you've probably you've made the right decision and you've, you've given the, the, I suppose, the chase line that, that time to sort of get up and... and probably nine times out of ten from when Cole kicks tactically, um, that happens. So I just think he his game knowledge and that little bit more experience maybe overseas has probably improved his kicking and his natural game is that attack. Um, he, he's a great balance, uh, especially coming on early, man. Like a lot of people have been like, Zan Sullivan going off, he's quite a key cop to that Blues team, both attack and defence. He just, he made a big statement 
probably a bigger statement than he was expected. You know, we talked around Amoni Narawa last year in terms of like, you know, his growth and where he was able to have a, a big season and how many kind of years that he had to fine tune his game. And I guess mature and understanding what's required as an outside back. And, you know, that's exactly the same force in terms of, you know, going away from, from here and being able to experience another, another style of rugby and then being able to come back more mature and I guess an understanding of what you might be as a player. And, you know, look at him on the weekend, you know, his defenders beat him was the, the best in the Blues. And I think the tactical now, which I think is required as a fullback is going to be really important. And you talk around Zahn Sullivan and his kicking game, you know, he can do that as well. So that pivot, second pivot role, which the Blues run with Perifeta and, um, Sullivan, you won't lose much when it comes to Forbes. So, yeah, I think some players have given are given the opportunity very young in terms of opportunities or just being able to mature quicker. And in terms, you know, obviously Forbes has been given an opportunity later at a later start, and now you're reaping the rewards of I guess that experience of experience something different. And then also the system in turn of what the Blues are creating, you can have performances like you did on the weekend with how the environment is at this stage. Uh, the biggest challenge for Cole and Harry Godfrey now is they're not the unknown. They've had big statement games, and that's where Super Rugby gets really tough. So having that ability to, uh, I suppose, evolve their game and, and manipulate what people think they're going to do and do something else would be crucial.